Poets and Pancakes by Asoka Mitran. Asoka Mitran, a Tamil writer, recounts his years at Gemini Studios in his book My Years with Boss, which talks of the influence of movies on every aspect of life in India. The Gemini Studios, located in Chennai, was set up in 1940. It was one of the most influential film producing organizations of India in the early days of Indian filmmaking. Its founder was S. S. Basan. The duty of Asoka Mitran in Gemini Studios was to cut out newspaper chippings, uh, clippings on a wide variety of subjects and store them in files. Many of these had to be written out by hand. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was the most well-informed well of all the members of the Gemini family. The following is an excerpt from his book, My Years with Boss. So Asoka Mitran was a writer, okay, and he has written a book, My Years with with boss basically asoka mitran was uh, worked with uh, worked at the gemini studio gemini studios was a film producing studios like you have the rk studios now and uh, all those the dharma productions so it's also gemini studios is a film producing studios and asoka mitran's job there was to cut out newspaper clippings and then file them together Okay, so his job seemed very insignificant, very small job, but again, a very, very important job for, you know, the newspaper clippings are very important. So the Gemini Studios produced film and Gemini Studios was a very well-known studio of its time. And the thing was that the newspaper clippings are important before and after the movie. Before the movie, because it helps write the script. Because, you know, you can say that uh, the Indian movies that were produced and even today that are produced it's kind of a reflection of the indian society and in the same way or at the same time the whatever the indian movies show also reflect on the society so the society follows what the indian movies do for example fashion sense okay and the indian movies are a reflection of the indian society so uh, S.S. Vasan was the one who founded the Gemini Studios and it was a very well-known studio. So this whole chapter is an excerpt from his book, My Years with Watch, was in which he, you know, tells an account of everything. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truckloads. Greta Garbo must have used it. Miss Gohar must have used it. Vajanti Mala must have also used it. But Rati Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. So, the makeup department of the Gemini Studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's tables. So, if you look at it, Poets and Pancakes. Here, Pancake refers to a makeup brand and it was a very well-known and a very expensive makeup uh, brand. And Asuka Mitran is trying to tell us from the fact that it was only used by a few actresses. That means the makeup was so uh, expensive and it was very limited that only a handful of people could get their hands on it. So Vijanti Mala, Greta Garbo, these are all top tier actresses, you know, one of the best actresses uh, of their respective countries. So as compared to Rati Agnihotri, who's not a very famous or not, you know, not uh, famous, but yeah, not as big of an actress as uh, Vajanti Mala or Greta Garbo. And despite it being such a big brand, Gemini Studios used to buy it in truckloads. That is... So it is telling us that Pancake was such a well-known, uh, not well-known exactly, but an expensive and a limited edition brand makeup brand and uh, at the same time how uh, gemini studios was so successful and was so um, let's say well equipped that it was able to buy such an expensive brand in truck loads now the makeup department of the gemini studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been robert clive's stables so they were in the Robert, uh, they were in Robert, uh, I mean, they were in a room which was earlier believed to be Robert Clive's stable. So Robert Clive uh, was a governor, was um, a Britisher. He was the governor general of the Bengal presidency at that time uh, for a long time and he had done some major works in Bengal. So he's a, you know, quite known name as a Britisher who had done much. Well, it will be against India, but for the Britishers, for the East India Company. 
So Robert Clive, before going to Bengal, was in Madras, and in Madras he used to move a lot. So he, the Gemini Studios, मतलब the makeup room was set up in a place where there were there was Robert Clive's table up there. A dozen of the buildings in the city are said to have been his residence. So for his brief life and ever even briefer stay in Madras, Robert Clive seems to have done a lot of moving besides fighting some impossible battles in remote corners of India and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. So Robert Clive uh, fought some battles. He was in the Battle of Bengal, okay, wherein he was a very key player in the annexation of Bengal, the earliest uh, earliest annexations of a place in India, and uh, so he did not live for very long, and uh, he stayed in Madras for a very short period of time, and whenever when he was staying in staying in Madras, he kept moving a lot, he kept changing his uh, you know residence, his place of staying, and that is why there are so many other buildings in madras that could be have been said you know that can be said that okay this was former this was robert clive's former residence the makeup room had the look of a hair cutting salon with lights at all angles around half a dozen large mirrors they were all incandescent lights so you can imagine the fear fury misery of those subjected to makeup so the makeup room had very huge large mirrors all over around and what was the thing was that it had lights around the you know borders of the mirror and the lights were incandescent lights now incandescent lights uh, mean the lights that emit a lot of heat okay so they shine very brightly they are very bright you can see very clearly in those lights but then they emit a lot of heat and that is why the makeup, uh, the puppy, the actress, actors and actresses, those were sitting there for their makeup done. They would be literally, uh, they would be so heated up and sweat up by sitting on those chairs, be chairs because of the heat of the light. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali who became too big for a studio and left. So the very first time in the initial days of Gemini Studios, studio, the makeup department was headed by a Bengali. But again, the you know bengali because of his work he became very famous he became a not a very famous but yes he became uh, you know uh, quite known a makeup artist and because gemini studios when it was in its initial days so nobody uh, wanted to stay in a smaller place than their reputation so the bengali artist reputation reputation uh, you know reputation outgrew the uh, reputation of Gemini Studios of those times. Later on, Gemini Studios was a very well-known studio. But in its initial days, it was when it was starting up. So the Bengali head, uh, who was the head of the makeup department, he left and he went someplace else. He was succeeded by a Maharashtrian who was assisted by a Dharwar Kannadika and Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian and Anglo-Burmese and the usual local Tamils. So after... The Bengali headed, then came another head for the makeup department, and that was a Maharashtrian. And that Maharashtrian was assisted by a Dharwar Kannadika, another Andhra Pradesh person, another Madras Indian Christian person, another Anglo Burmese person, so, and the usual local Tamils. So all this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before AIR and Doordarshan began broadcasting programs on national integration. So, you know, AIR All India Radio and Doordarshan later on went on producing a lot of shows that would show that, you know, we have to live together, we have to come together and um, all the different ethnicities and caste and, you know, uh, all of us uh, different people who are living in India, we have to come together. So before that only in Gemini Studios, you see a lot of national integration happening where so many different uh, people from different coming from different regions, speaking different languages with different religions came together and were working. You know, you see a Maharashtrian, you see the Tamils, you see the Andhra people, the anglo burmese even the, you know, English were there and the Christians, Indian Christians, all of those people. This gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into a hideous crimson hued monster with the help of truckloads of pancake and a number of other locally made potions and lotions. So he is referring to the people as a hideous crimson hued monster because 
uh, that is because in the initial days now nowadays the makeup is very much inspired by you know blue eyeliners and blue eye shadows or green and metallic and silver and golden so in the earlier days when gemini studios was in place and the films that were produced they used to have uh, the majority of shades or the the you know the color palette would weigh towards a red and a pink thing so they would be they would have red or pink lips and pink and red blush and pink and red eye shadow so all of it would be pink and they he is referring to them as hideous monsters hideous crimson hued monsters so hued because the shade it was very toned down they were not very warm colors they were very bright they were very too much if you see them in reality there was too much makeup put on their face and the reason for that was that because the camera quality and the screen quality at that time would reduce the amount of makeup that would show on the person's face so they used to they had to put on a lot of makeup and when that would show up on screen so it would amount to very you know less or you know normal amount of uh, makeup in reality they used to look like hideous monsters crimson monsters but then when uh, you know when you see in reality they would look like monsters but when you see it on camera then that would they would look beautiful so the amount of makeup that was put upon them was too much those were the days of mainly indoor shooting and they don't did not used to go out that much outdoor shootings were not really happening i suppose the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the movie so i said that they had to put on a lot of makeup so that when they are on camera because there are so many lights towards them the camera removes some kind of makeup so when they are on camera the camera uh, the makeup would reduce to a very normal amount a strict hierarchy was maintained in the makeup department the chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly his senior assistant the second hero and heroine the junior assistant and main comedian and so forth the players who played the crowd were responsibility of the office boy so even in the makeup department you see that there was a hierarchy not everybody did everybody's makeup so there was one chief makeup artist that would work on the lead actors and actresses and then his senior most assistant would work on the second lead actor and actresses who were playing the second main role after the lead actor and actresses and then their junior assistant would work on the comedian because the comedian also played a very important role in the movie and then then uh, you know and the hierarchy went on so lesser the importance of the role of the actor in the movie so you know the lesser titled person would work on it now the players who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy so there was one office boy who used to do the makeup of the people in the crowd now the of course the makeup is not very detailed because their face was not at all visible it was just like um, it was just made realizable that they were standing there So there was one office boy whose responsibility was to do the makeup of the people so that they don't completely look, you know, very dark skinned or very, you know, they could be presentable in the camera because the lights were so uh, bright and flashy that they needed some makeup and everything was, you know, very high ti- highlighted there. So even the makeup department of the Gemini Studio had an office boy. So he's again reiterating the uh, level and the, you know. a mass the gemini studios was that even its makeup department had an office boy so it's like the number of people that gemini studios employed in those times so on the days when there was a crowd shooting you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel and slapping it on the crowd players the idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in the process of applying makeup so he was saying he's trying to tell us that uh, his work was such matlab his work was not very detailed or not of a lot of skill that you know to apply makeup he would just take a big vessel and he is using the word paint for makeup and he is using a word paint because he would literally paint the faces of the people he would apply so much pan that means so much foundation and so much you know surfacing on the face that the com- the pores and all of that would completely just uh, you know they would completely just vanish off and the people would just look like white colored statues so if in reality you see them see them they would look like white ghouls literally okay and um, he wasn't exactly a boy he was in his early 40s having entered the studio years ago in hope of becoming a star actor or a top screen writer director or lyrics writer he was a bit of a poet so 
the office boy was the title or the name given to him but he was actually a boy he was a man because he was in his early 40s 41 or 42 and his he had entered the industry and he had come to gemini studios uh hoping to become a very big superstar or an actor or a director or a lyrics writer because at those times these were the people who were very these were the people who were very popular so uh, you know when a film was released it was the main actor and actresses the, the main actors uh, and the leads that were uh, acting in the film and the director and the lyrics writer because the songs were very famous and the singers and the music artists maybe one or two so basically these were the handful of people that were very that became very popular after the success of a film other than that the people you know the other people who are there who would work on a film they would their names would not be such a big hit he was a bit of a poet in those days, I worked in a cubicle, two whole sides of which were French windows. I didn't know at that time they were called French windows. Seeing me sitting at my desk during uh, newspapers in day in and day out, most people thought I was doing next to nothing. It is likely that the boss thought likewise too. So he, he used to sit, Asoka Mitran used to sit in a very in a small cubicle and his work was mainly to tear the pages of the newspaper because to file them to get the information and even after the movie is released to get the critics view and what has been said about the film uh, why was the film liked whether me need an actress a lead actor and actress the reason the film went hinder whatever the reason for uh, film going successful or even the failure of the film was so the newspapers of course played a very important role and that is why Ahsoka Mithun was the most well informed on the sets because he knew the in and out and everything about what could be added to the film to make it good and people like it so because his job seemed like nothing to everybody else he they other people would just think that he's just tearing up newspaper pages so um anyone who felt i should be given some occupation would barge into my cubicle and deliver an extended lecture so anybody everybody would think that he did not have a job he was just sitting there even his own boss used to think that and anybody would think okay kuch kaam nahi hai, let's go to him and they would just barge into his cubicle and they would just give him a lecture or you know talk to some the, to him about something just you know anything because they would think that asoka mitran is completely free he did not have any work the boy in the makeup department had decided I should be enlightened uh, on how great literary talent was being allowed to go waste in a department fit only for barbers and perverts. So the office boy, because his dream was to become a superstar or an actor or lyrics writer or director, he used to come in a lot. To Ashoka Mitran and he, he used to you know keep on going and going how Gemini Studios has given him the work of an office boy and how the studios is wasting such a precious talent that means he himself that they had in a room full of barbers you know in a in a work where only barbers and perverts would fit, uh, would fit because barbers you know it's a it would, used to look like a salon a hair cutting salon and perverts because there used to be a lot of touching and makeup and beautification of things and all of that stuff so he completely thought that the talent was going to waste soon i was praying for crowd shooting all the time nothing short of it could save me from his epics so of course asoka mitran kept praying well, he he really wanted crowd shooting should happen because in crowd shooting only the office boy would go away and paint the faces of the crowd and people in all instances of frustration you will always find the anger directed towards a single person openly or covertly and this man of the makeup department was convinced that all his woes ignominy and neglect were due to kothamangalam subbu subbu was the number two at gemini studio so all his saying all the lectures and all the extended speeches that he would give to Asoka Mitran, there was one thing there that uh, he used to think, uh, he, uh, Asoka Mitran is trying to tell us that the office boy used to think that, uh, uh, you know, Asoka Mitran realized it and the case was that the office boy, my, means the office boy, he blamed Kota Mangalam Subbu for whatever hap was happening to him. So the office boy blamed Subbu that it, it should have been him, the office boy in place of Subbu. And because Subbu came, that is why the office boy was neglected and he was not given his right place and Subbu was given the number two position. So basically Kota Mangalam Subbu was the number two at Gemini Studios. Number two means he was a very important person and most of the films that were made uh, was made with Subbu at that time. He couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our own grown-up makeup boy had. On the contrary, he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times for when he began his career there were no firmly established film producing companies or studios. 
so he did have a very great start because of course he started with gemini studios but then he in his initial days he must have to struggle a lot because he wished to become an actor and at that time there was not many film producing studios so it was very hard for him in his initial days you know regarding his profession because there was no other source for him to earn money of course he had to go on and take up different jobs so that is why his dream it, it was very difficult for him to achieve his dream in the initial days before Gem he joined gemini studios even in the matter of education especially formal education education subu couldn't have had an appreciable lead over our boy but by virtue of being born a brahmin a virtue indeed so of course uh, according to the office boy uh, according to the office boy uh, subu had a very you know not a very great start with the gemini studios his first film does not did very good first few films did not give, give do very good on the screen and the office boy of course thought that i could i was in subu's place all my films even the first film would have gone a hit a super hit or you know his first few films would have been much more successful than subu's and even in terms of education uh, you know he wouldn't have had such you know um uh he was not very educated as compared to me means the office boy but because all because he was a brahmin so all of that he didn't have good education or you know comparable to the office boy he did not have a great start with the films regarding the films all of that was neglected just because he was a brahmin so according to the office boy he was given a chance over him because subu was a brahmin and it was a it was a virtue to be a brahmin on those times he must have had exposure to more affluent situations and people so just because he was a brahmin he would have had more opportunities in more such situations where he could have gone up to that level because apart from that there could not be any other reason why subu was better than the office boy he had the ability to look cheerful at all times even after having had a hand in a flop film he always had work for somebody he could never do things on his own but his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principles completely and turn his entire creativity to his principles advantage he was tailor made for films here was a man who could be inspired when commanded so subu had this quality that he would look cheerful at all times even if the film was flop it was not as successful as expected still he would not be drowsy he would be cheerful and you know always he had that star status built in him inbuilt in him so he would always you know order people for to do it for, to st stuff for him he would never do it himself so that would uh, add to his personality of you know star ness or the superstar personality or the superstar character that subu had in him so he was tailor made for films he was made from he can be inspired when commanded that means he would such a soul he would be so good at acting that he could you know just quickly bring an emotion the rat fights the tigress underwater and kills her but takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly i don't know how to do the scene the producer would say and subu would come out with four ways of the rat pouring affection on its victims offspring so you see that uh, you see that how the producer would say that how do you do this you know this is given a, a, an example that how the rat fights the tigress underwater because underwater the tiger doesn't ha hold much power and the rat can move underwater and kills her okay and takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly so how the rat kills the tigress but then the tigress children were taken care by the rat so rat takes care of the children of the the the, uh, the tigress whom the rat had killed so the producer would say he didn't understand how do you do this uh, scene how do you bring out this scene that the people understand it how do you show it in emotions on uh, on the face and subu would co quickly come up with four five different ways how do you do the emotion wherein the rat is you know showing affection to somebody's children who he had just killed the producer would um and would come out with 14 more uh, sorry good but i am not sure it is effective enough the producer would say and in a minute subu would come out with 14 more alternatives so even still if the producer were not satisfied even after su doing such thing still uh, malab even after that subu would again come up with 14 different ways so of course this is an exaggeration not exactly 14 or 4 ways but what asoka mitran tries to trying to say is that he would come out so that subu was so talented and he was made for films that in any situation for any scene for any emotion he would come up with different ways how to show that emotion without even without using any dialogues film making must have been and was so easy with a man like subu around and if if there was a man who gave direction and definition to gemini studios during his golden years it was subu so of course subu was such a 
um, you know, assistant director, that all the means whatever, you know, whatever uh, line the producer wanted to show emotion to, and Subhu was would quickly direct the actors how how to do the film and how he would do it. Subhu had a desperate uh, had a separate identity as a poet, and though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms, he deliberate deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses. So Subhu was a very important. and he was number 2 because he was the assistant director that thing missed and he was the assistant director at the gemini studios and he had the capability of bringing out any emotion or any way to show any scene which would seem impossible to the producer and he would come up with different ways how can you portray the scene on the film even if you do not have dialogues so he was such good of an assistant director and he was also a poet a very good poet and subhu had the talent that he could write much in with much more you know complex way hiding and you know twisting and turning it but then he dedicated and he tried to write for the masses so that most of the people can understand that means he deliberate deli- he had the talent within him but he deliberately wrote in such a way that most of the people can understand it he would make it so easy his success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literally achievements or so his critics felt okay so because he was so good in directing that often his poetry work would be ne- neglected you know he was such a good poet that would pe- that people would forget because his films would do so good on screen he composed several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction and also wrote a sprawling uh, novel thillana mohanambalam Mohanambal, with dozens of very deftly etched characters, he quite successfully he quite successfully recreated the mood and manners of the Dev Dasis of the early twentieth century. He was an amazing actor. He never aspired to the lead roles, but whatever subsidiary role he played in any of the films, he performed better than the supposed main players. So Subhu was so talented. He was so good at acting. He was so good at directing. He was so good at writing poems. So this was basically all the three things that the office boy wanted to become. He either wanted to become a lead actor. or a director or a lyric writer and he could become none he would just reduce to the title of a of an office boy and here subhu was there who had the same three aspirations or qualities or whatever you would say he was engaged in all these three professions that the office boy would wa- have wanted to do and subhu was very good at it and the office boy would neglect the fact that he was actually talented and that's why he was valued the office boy would just uh, point to the fact that he was getting all of this because he was a brahmin there was no other reason if so, the office boy would have been a brahmin he would have been more successful and better than subhu himself he had a genuine love for a uh, genuine love for anyone he came across and his house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far relations and acquaintances so he he really loved everybody he had a very cheerful character even if the film flopped he never you know uh he he never really quite frowned as such and he had that superstar quality or character within him he would go on ordering people always anybody else was doing his work for him and there were so many people always living at his house i mean he had a huge heart and he had loved everybody it seemed again subhu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them so he, he didn't even think of the fact that why am i feeding all of these people i am wasting my money why am i doing that he was just go on do, doing that because he loved everybody such a charitable and improvident man and yet he had enemies so now what the author did was he had built subhu's character in all positive way again after reading this of course you would not think and you would think of subhu as a very great and a very talented and exceptional man but here comes the bomb or the climax in this lesson basically that okay he had enemies was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss or was it his general demeanor that resembled a psychophant's or his readiness to say nice things about everything so what was the reason for that was it because he was so close to the boss the number one of at the gemini studios or was it because he you know resembled uh, his general demeanor his general personality resembled that with a psychophant's or you know psychophant meaning uh, you know he would always um, act in a certain way so that he could gain in the favor of the important people who the powerful people or was his readiness to say nice things about everything that everybody and everything that he would never you know tell wrong about anybody 
In any case, there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subbu. So everything was good, everything was okay. But then this, there was one person, the office boy, who wanted everything bad and the direst of things. That means the ugliest of things for Subbu. And of course, the reason for that is that the office boy wanted to be like Subbu. He wanted to be Subbu himself. He wanted to be in place of Subbu. Whatever life Subbu had, he wanted that life. And he did, couldn't have it. And it's his jealousy and his neglect. He is not able to understand that on his own. That may be the fact he is not that talented. He is blaming it on different uh, you know reasons that maybe Subbu was a Brahmin that is why he was weighed more than me and that is why he was seeing more talented than me whereas I was more talented I had more good education my films would do better than him all of that stuff you saw Subbu always with the boss but in the attendance roles he was grouped under a department called the story department comprising a lawyer and an assembly of writers and poets the lawyer was also officially known as the legal advisor but everybody referred to him as the opposite an extremely talented actress who was also extremely temperamental once blew over the sets while everyone stood stunned the lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment when the actress paused for breath the lawyer said to her one minute please and played back the recording there was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul about the act Actresses stared against the producer, but when she heard her voice again through the sound equipment, she was struck dumb. A girl from the countryside, she hadn't gone through all the stages of early experience and generally perceived a position of importance and sophistication that she had found herself catap um, catapulted into. She never quite recovered from the terror she felt that day. That was the end of a brief and brilliant acting career, the legal advisor, who was also a member of the story department, had unwittingly brought about that sad end. While every other member of the department wore, mem uh, wore a kind of uniform, khadi dhoti, with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt, the legal advisor wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail. Often he looked uh, alone and helpless, a man of cold logic in crowd of dreamers, a neutral man in an assembly of Gandhis and khadis. Like so many of those who were chose to, uh, close to the boss, he was allowed to produce a film and though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used on it, not much came of this film. Then one day the boss closed down the story department and this was perhaps the only instance in all human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. So now another player comes in and that is that, uh, you know, Subbu was always with the boss every time. But during the attendance rose, of course, when the attendance was taken about who was present on the work that day, he was grouped under a department. He would be with a department called the story department. And that story department uh, comprised a lawyer and an assembly of writers and poets. So the lawyer was like the legal advisor, but his job was different. He was the legal advisor because there are needs of a legal advisor in writing a script that uh, whatever things should be mentioned in the script, what words should be mentioned in the script, what not, and what could bring, you know, uh, any controversy to the film, you know, speaking or writing or showing something on the film, what could bring a controversy to the film that could, you know, be anti-national or anything like that could anger the people, the sentiments of the people and all of that stuff. <clears throat> he was referred to, he had to he was the uh, legal advisor but then everybody referred to him as the opposite because he did not really advise anything but he would rather break things down okay so there was so that's a story that there was one very talented actress but she was also very temperamental okay so she was very talented but very temperamental because you know she would experience very quick changes of mood suddenly she was very happy okay all of that stuff and suddenly she was very angry on a very small thing so she was very very talented but then she was very temperamental also so she blew over these sets that means uh, she became very angry on the sets for some or the other reason she became very agitated and started st shouting and you know throwing fits and all of that stuff everybody was stunned because nobody could speak because they wanted to keep the actress she was very talented and she could do good for the film but what the lawyer or the legal advisor did was he 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 very silently switched on the recording equipment okay so he switched on the camera and he recorded the actress and when the actress was done done about everything then he played the recording when when the actress you know um uh, there was nothing in uh, sorry when the actress paused for breath means he was he, he she kept doing and shouting and doing that and that uh, the lawyer 
then she then he played the video again there was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul, foul about the actress's student against the producer but when she heard her voice again through the sound equipment she was struck down so whatever the actress was saying she, saying she was not saying anything wrong anything foul or anything like that about the producer so she was just basically ranting she was just saying saying it angrily and shouting what the matter of her uh, you know the matter and the content of whatever she was saying was not very hurtful or not very wrong in that case but then when she realized that she had been recorded and whatever rant or you know whatever instance or experience that she had it was recorded by the lawyer she was struck down she was very very angry and you know she had she was like it was like open to her she she had faced her own self and that is why i mean that was the end of her career so that was the end of a brief and brilliant acting career the legal adviser who was also a member of the story department and unwittingly brought about that sad end so after that the actress was so angry i mean she was very she was not very okay with the legal adviser recording her and that too when she had not saw, uh, said very, uh, anything much wrong about it it was just the way that she had said she was just shouting and that was and even that everybody was bearing it because she was a very talented actress and she could do good to the film so you know every other department they would wear khadi and uh, you know kurti and all that the lawyer the legal adviser would wear pant and you know suit and all of that and he was neutral he was not a khandi he was not a khadi and he was very neutral in his approach so he was allowed to produce a film and though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used on it not much came of the film so even he was allowed to produce a film but then the film was flopped so the one day the boss closed down the story department and this was perhaps the only instance in all human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home so one of the instances that means this is such an irony that uh, you know um, means th- th- there were two or three instances where in first the legal adviser recorded the actress and the actress left and left the movie did not shoot the movie anymore and the second being that how you know the legal adviser produced a movie that means the story department and then the movie was not very so they of course they incurred a huge loss on that because a lot of raw material pancake that means makeup and why pancake and raw stock doesn't only mean makeup but a lot of other resources went into making of that film and it completely flopped the it the gemini studios incurred a huge loss on that film that the story department the, the legal adviser sp- produced and sponsored produced basically so this was perhaps the only instance where the lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home that means the story department was closed and that is why the legal adviser the lawyer was lost his job because he was a part of the story department now the gemini studios was the favorite haunt of poets like s t s u g r sangu subramanyam krishna shastri and uh, harin uh, harindranath chattopadhyay it had an excellent mess which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night those were the days when congress ruled um, ruled mail prohibition and meeting over a cup of coffee was rather satisfying entertainment barring the office boys and a couple of clerks everybody else at the studios radiated leisure a prerequisite for poetry most of them were khadi and worshiped gandhi ji but beyond that they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind so always at gemini studios you could found very talented people especially poets like sds yogi r he was also a very good poet and all that as sangu subramanyam krishna shastri harindranath chattopadhyay all of these were very good and well known poets of their times and gemini studios had a very good mess they they provided excellent coffee so apart from the office boy and the clerk that means the lower ranked people apart from those of those handful of lower ranked people everybody else would be sitting and chatting in the mess at all times in most part of the night so when congress ruled meant prohibition and meeting over a cup of coffee was rather satisfying entertainment so uh, you know at th- the, those times congress was putting on a lot of rules and regulations on what to do and what not to do and that is why sitting there and chatting over coffee was very satisfying because they could actually they could uh, really chat about something that they could not normally do of course it was under the pretense of making a movie and working in a film producing studio so Uh, most of them wore khadi and worshipped gandhi but beyond that they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind so it was just in words that they would worship gandhi and they would wear khadi but then apart from that they were not really interested in any political matter of any kind so you know they would be against communism so for them communism just meant a lot of violence 
okay here he's describing it a communist was a godless man he had no filial or conjugal love he had no com- uh, compunction about killing his own parents or his children he was always out to cause and spread unrest and violence among uh, among innocent and ignorant people such notions which prevailed everywhere else in south india at that time also naturally floated about vaguely among the khadi clad poets of gemini studio evidence of it was soon forthcoming so they were only they of course they were very gandhis they were uh, khadi but when it co- came to communism they were strictly against communism they strictly did not want communism and they would see communists as people who would just produce violence and violence and violence when frank bookman's moral rearmament army some 200 strong visited madras sometime in 1952 they could not have found a warmer host in india than the gemini studio someone called the group an international circus so somebody called the gemini studio an international circus because the kinds of people that visited the gemini studio here you can see frank butchman's moral rearmament army they were 200 in number those two also those also visited you know gemini studios they were hosted by gemini studios when they visited madras so they weren't very good on the trippies and their acquaintance with animals was only at the dinner table but they presented two plays in a most professional manner the jotham valley and the forgotten factor ran sub- several shows in madras and along with the other citizens of the city the gemini family of 600 saw the plays over and over again the message of the plays were usually plain and simple homilies but the sets and costumes were first rate madras and the tamil drama community were terribly impressed and for some years almost all the tamil plays had a scene of sunrise and sunset in the manner of Jotham Valley with a bare stage a white background curtain and a tune played on the flute it was some years later that i learned that the mra was a kind of counter movement to international communism and the big bosses of madras like mr watson simply played into their hands so when the army came uh, it, they, they came to madras of course the gemini studios hosted them and what was it was that the gemini studios would you know stage uh, two of their fair plays over and over again and the 600 people so that's a huge number for those times that a studio film producing studio uh, employing over 600 people they would play that you know they would stage the play over and over again in different parts of madras all over madras and jotham valley was one particular very famous play of them and it became such a sensation that for a long period of time many times whenever they had to show whenever anybody else had to show a scene of sunrise or sunset they would just put on a white colored background dim the lights and they they would you know shadow of a sun or something and there would uh, there would be a tune playing for sunrise or sunset that so that would be that was inspired by the jotham by the play jotham valley so such was the effect and popularity of the play jotham valley done I am not sure however that this was indeed the case for the unchangeable aspects of these big bosses and their enterprises remain the same MRA MRA or no MRA international communism or no international communism the staff of Gemini Studios had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes of at least 20 nationalities it was such a change from the usual collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department so it was some years later that i learned that the mra that is of course the moral rearmament army was a kind of counter movement to international communism so the reason why gemini studios hosted frank butchman's uh, mra was because it was an uh, you know counter answer to international communism of course everybody at gemini studios i mean the most of the people were against communism and the big bosses of madras like mr vasan simply played into their hands i am not sure however this was indeed the case for the unchangeable aspects of these big bosses and their enterprises remained the same mra or no mra international communism or no international communism the staff of gemini studios had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes of at least 20 nationalities it was such a change from the usual collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department so the mra the moral rearmament army was a good crowd to the gemini studios and uh, later uh, soka mitra realized that the mri was hosted because it was an answer to international communism but then the case was that uh, whether it was the case or not that's not really uh, soka mitra is not really sure about that and the simple fact about it is that the staff at gemini studios is very happy and you know 
they would they were happily host the people at mra so you know there were people of different nationalities different hues means different colors because people of different regions came over a few months later the telephone lines of the big bosses of madras buzzed and once again we at gemini studios cleared a whole shooting stage to welcome another visitor all they said was that he was a poet from england the only poets from england the simple gemini staff knew or heard were wordsworth and tennyson the more literate one knew of keats shelley and byron though and one or two might have faintly come to know of someone by the name eliot who was the poet visiting the gemini studios now so again some time later the phone rang and gemini studio was informed that there was in, there was a poet from england who was visit, who was going to visit them so of course the people at gemini studio the not so literate people knew only of very famous poets very common poets not many much the other people who had slightly more knowledge knew of some more and mostly you know might have come to know about the name eliot george eliot but then who was this person who was this poet from england that was visiting them he is not a poet he is an editor that's why the boss is giving him a big reception so vasan was also the editor of the popular tamil weekly ananda vikatan he was in the editor of many of the known names of british publications in madras that is those known at the gemini studios since the top men of the hindu were taking the initiative the surmise is that the poet was the editor of a daily but not from the manchester guardian or the london times that was all that even the most well informed among us knew so he was not a poet he was an editor and he was also not from the manchester guardian or the london times so there was very little information about this person english poet that was or editor that was visiting them at last around 4 in the afternoon the poet or editor arrived he was a tall man very english very serious and of course very unknown to all of us battling with half a dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage the boss read out a long speech it was obvious that he knew too knew precious little about the poet or the actor so this is the case that even though um the boss himself uh, did not know very much about so even after the boss did not know anything about the editor still he gave a very very long reception to him welcoming him and all of that stuff the speech was in all the most general terms but here and there it was peppered with words like freedom and democracy then the poet spoke he couldn't have addressed a more dazed and silent audience no one knew what he was talking about and his accent defeated any attempt to understand what he was saying so now even when the english poet the editor came he gave a long speech and the audience were completely silent because they had no idea at all what the editor was talking about and on top of it his accent was in such a way that they were not able to understand a word that he was saying so the whole thing lasted about an hour he left and everybody was just peppering about what did he just say they were in complete and utter bafflement complete confusion what is an english poet doing in a film studio which makes tamil films what are we doing uh, people whose lives least afforded them the possibility of cultivating a taste for english poetry the poet looked pretty baffled too for he too must have felt the sheer incongruity of his talk about the thrills and travails of an english poet his visit remained an unexplained mystery so all of this they, nobody could make sense of the visit they did not know much about the editor the editor did not know because the people were such you know different and like almost like aliens to him The great prose writers of the world may not admit it but my conviction grows stronger day after day that prose writing is not and cannot be the true pursuit of a genius it is with a patient persistent persevering pers- persevering drudge with a heart so strong in that nothing can break it rejection slips stone mean a thing to him he at once set about making a fresh copy of the long prose piece and sends it on to another editor in closing postage for the return of the manuscript it was for such people that the hindu had published a tiny announcement in an insignificant corner of an unimportant page a short story contest contest or a contest organized by a british periodical by the name the encounter of course the encounter wasn't a known commodity among the gemini literati so um uh, now of course the soka mitra in simplest of words explain what means of what for him a poet is a poet is a genius and he's patient and even if his work gets rejected he does not stop he starts all over again and stuff like that now in the hindu for such people there was a, on in a very you know on a very small corner in a on important page that means it was in such a corner that people half of the people were not even notice it usually 
so there was one uh, announcement of a contest and that was the encounter so the encounter was in was a british periodical you know uh, periodical paper or journal or what and um, of course it was not a very well known paper and that is why the literati general Liter gemini literati did not know much about it i wanted to get an idea of the periodical before i spent a considerable sum in postage sending a manuscript in england in those days the british council library had an entrance with no long winded signboards and notices to make you feel even sneaking into a forbidden area and there were copies of the encounter lying about in various degrees of freshness almost untouched by readers when i read the editor's name i heard a bell ringing in my shrunken heart it was the poet who had visited the gemini studios i felt like i had found a long lost brother and i sang as i sealed the envelope and wrote out his address so you know he also he 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 tried to know uh you know before he wanted to get about what or how the encounter is before he sent his own work or you know uh, some in postage sending a manuscript in to england before sending any work to england for you know the contest so the british council library that was there in madras it had long winded it had no long winded sign was so it was a very simple library with not such you, you it was not that you were you would feel like it was a forbidden area you could not come into it because there were not many sign boards or instructions or do this and do that and all of that and there were copies of the encounter that which is lying around everywhere and they were not even touched by readers or readers did not even read the encounter when i read the editor's name so of course the same english editor who came he was the one who would uh, who was an editor for the encounter the periodical the british periodical so he he wrote he sealed the envelope and he sent it to the english poets or the editor's name i felt that he too would be singing the same song at the same time so he also felt again it's a hidden irony here means uh, the way so kamitra said that he would also think that long lost brothers of indian films discover each other by singing the same wrong in the first reel and in the final reel of the film stephen spender stephen that was his name and years later when i was out of gemini studios and i had much time but not much money anything at a reduced price attracted my attention on the footpath in front of the madras mount road post office there was a pile of brand new books for 50 paise each actually they were copies of the same book an elegant paperback of american origin special low price student edition in connection with the 50th anniversary of the russian revolution i paid 50 paise and picked up a copy of the book the god that failed six eminent men of letters and six great essays described their journeys into communism and their disillusioned return Andre Gide, Richard Wright, Ignacio Silon, Arthur Coestle, Louis Fisher, and Stephen Spender. Stephen Spender. Suddenly, the book assumed tremendous significance. Stephen Spender, the poet who had visited Gemini Studios. In a moment, I felt a dark chamber of my mind lit up by a hazy illumination. The reaction to Stephen Spender at Gemini Studios was no longer a mystery. the boss of the gemini studios may not have much to do with spender's poetry but not with his god that failed so now after reading this after seeing this book the god that failed that is when he realized that the english editor that had come to gemini studio had come because of the mra the moyal rearmament army because the mra had performed a stage and performed a play and that play was against communism and that is why you know how gemini studios was one that hosted anti communism in those times that play and people uh, you know did not really understand in that deep way what the plays were trying to teach them but they were just you know appalled by the way they staged the play their dresses their you know scenery their everything was so perfect and so amazing and appalling to the viewers so even at the people at the gemini studios did not really pay attention to the message though the message not no was not very complex or no was not very difficult to understand but they were so appalled by the you know staging of the play the different elements that were added to the play that they disregarded why the play was staged or what was the meaning of it so that stage that mra the army was basically that how they presented that uh how they were an answer how they were anti communist people and how gemini studios had you know hosted those anti communist people and the english poet now finally 
uh, Asoka Mitra understood that the English poet or the editor that came was Stephen Spender and he had come to Gemini Studios because the Gemini Studios had hosted the MRA, the Moral Rearmament Army. And that is how uh, Stephen was not able to understand the people's reaction because he was also not aware that the people was not realizing that he had come for, uh, you know, uh, he had come for the anti-communism thing and for the people have hosted MRA. So the people at Gemini Studios and the boss could not establish a connection between that, uh, you know, connection that Stephen Spender has come because they hosted the MRA. So the boss of the Gemini Studios may not have had much to do with Spender's poetry, but not with his god that failed. Because the god that failed referred to how, uh, you know, they came away from communism or how communism just you know ruined them in every way and the bosses could not understand at that time that it was actually stephen spender was here for the anti-communist move you know wave and emotion